<laughs> we'll get started with the initial introductions and all of that. So anyway, welcome to uh, to everyone to our uh, Nature Program series this evening. Um, I uh, am going to start out by thanking our program sponsors. So if you wait one minute here and I will share our screen. So our program sponsors are Hancock Lumber, Bank of New Hampshire, and Ragged Mountain Equipment. So they sponsor this and all of our uh, evening and weekend programs. And uh, just to give you an idea of some of the programs coming up, in the next uh, month or so. Uh, the next one on the books is literally our environmental book group discussion. And uh, the book we are reading is The Human Age, The World Shaped by Us by Diane Ackerman. It's actually a pretty fascinating book. I've been uh, enjoying, uh, enjoying that. That's on Wednesday, August 5th then at three in the afternoon. Then the following evening, Thursday, August 6th, um, Will Broussard is uh, sharing a program on shorebirds and uh, he'll be, uh, that's at seven o'clock on Thursday, August 6th. That's a Zoom program. And then on the 7th, we're actually having a field program and that is a tree identification and forest workshop and that is led by our consulting forester at Tin Mountain, Dan Stefanowskis. So we um, will be heading out to the Dr. Michael Klein Memorial Forest on that day from 10 to noon and um, there's some wonderful trees on uh, that property. So Dan will enlighten us on tree ID and forestry in general. Uh, and then lastly, just a plug for our summer intern research recap. That's something we typically do as an eco form, but we bump that to an evening program uh, on Thursday, October 13th at 7 p.m. So all three of our interns will do a short presentation about what they have been up to um, during, uh, during the summer, which has been a lot of cool stuff, I will say that. So... Um, anyway, if you're interested in any of those programs or would like more information, feel free to check out our uh, website and uh, you can find out that and a lot more information. So, oh, my sister's here. Hi, Shari. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's always fun. Um, yeah. Now I'm totally distracted here. Okay, so this evening's program was originally <laughs> Ecology and Moths of the Pine Barrens and um, in honor of National Moth Week. And unfortunately, our presenter, Jeff Lugie from the Nature Conservancy, something came up and he wasn't able to present. So our very own Dr. Rick Vanderpoel jumped right in. And not only is he going to be discussing moths, but he's going to be talking about butterflies as well. So uh, I'm very excited about that because it is definitely moth and butterfly time of, uh, of year. So I believe everybody is muted at this point. If you have a qu any questions, you can feel free to use the chat box during the presentation and I'll be kind of monitoring that. And then at the end, we can unmute and you can we can have questions directly to Rick. Um, okay, so Rick, I think you should be all set um, to be able to screen share. So. Yep. All right. Well, I'll start, you know, before I uh, jump into the screen so you can see that lovely New England butterfly behind me. Uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> Just testing you. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you can see some wonderful butterflies midwinter down at the Museum of Science in Boston. I don't know what their current sort of COVID policy is, but that's uh, where I saw this beauty. And in midwinter, you can take pictures in a greenhouse that's nice and warm and see butterflies from around the world. So there's things to do even when you think everything's asleep and down for the count. Um, we'll talk a lot about uh, both butterflies and moths and, and pretty much a 12-month occupation, even without going to the Museum of Science in the wintertime, because you have all stages of their life cycle that you can seek out and actually engage with. A lot of my former students um, ended up picking up eggs and then 
uh, allowing them to hatch into caterpillars, raising the caterpillars on food sources they knew they liked, and then of course watching them pupate, develop a cocoon in a box or a terrarium, and then watching them emerge. And you can do that in your own home. Uh, I, of course, don't encourage you to do that with, you know, like Carner Blue Butterflies, our only federally endangered bug, but you can certainly do it with one of the several thousand species of moths and butterflies we have, which we'll talk about tonight. Okay, I'm going to share screen right now, and let's see, we'll do screen one and bring this up. Let's see, actually screen two, get that going, and there we have it. Now, can everybody see that screen okay? No. 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 Okay, let's try to get screen number one then. Let's see. Put that down. And we'll see if we can get screen number one. We tried this before and found out that I guess screen number one is really, I mean, the, not trying to split the screen is the easiest way to do it. How does that work for everybody? It's looking good. good. All right. Now, I think I've got to bring, can everybody see the whole, the whole thing? Because I'm seeing the host bar on the right-hand side. And if I yeah, we do, see the host bar too. Okay. So if I do the screen, what does that do? Can you see the big screen now? Or did you lose it? That we can see your note page. Okay, that's not going to work. Okay, so we'll go ahead and and stop that, and we'll. We, we found this out before. It's difficult to actually do it on a single screen, uh, but we'll, we'll manage. Okay. All right, I'll get it here before too long. All right, we'll try it again. All right, we're back. And I'm going to take out the panel so we can go ahead and take a look at, get up to the top, start this off officially. There we go. All right. So uh, I have been lucky enough to uh, work with butterflies and moths since 1986. Um, I started with a Carner Blue Butterfly Survey of the Concord Pine Barrens back when there were actually a lot more pine barrens than there are today um, in Concord anyway. We've got 13 sites in the Northeast that represent um, that type of habitat, a pine land, pine bush, pine barren habitat. And that's of course what Jeff Lucci was gonna talk about tonight. And uh, not that I'm gonna try and steal his thunder because I think it's worth getting him to talk about all the work he's done in the Pine Barrens in New Hampshire. That's where I got my looking at butterflies in a more critical way, working with a gentleman by the name of Dale Schweitzer. And Dale worked with the Nature Conservancy and then for NatureServe for about 40 years and has authored several publications on different types of lepidopter and butterflies and moths. Uh, over the years and has been my sort of go-to guy for identification. And if you thought fungi were challenging, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it's just about as bad in the world of moths and butterflies, but we'll, we'll get into it. And, and for those of you who haven't sort of studied these, these groups, um, it's like I say to all my fellow uh, botany students, start with ferns. There are only 65 of them. So the same goes here, start with butterflies. <laughs> There's about one twelfth the number of, so uh, it's a much e easier group to accommodate. Uh, 
water butterflies uh, are sort of queued up to do. We're talking about the uh, order Lepidoptera, Lepido meaning scale, and uh, Terra referring to the wing. So it's a scale winged insect. They have simple capitate or clubbed antennae, which you can see right here uh, on these guys. Uh, they're largely nectar feeders, hence they have a very long proboscis or tongue that they can uh, feed nectar in various types of flowers. Um, as larvae, they mostly are leaf chewers, but some uh, also chew dead leaves, chew bark, chew various types of plant materials. So they're not exclusively uh, leaf chewers, but most of the butterfly larvae are. They develop into pupae. They have a, a sort of, we'll talk about the life cycle in a second, but that's uh, certainly what all butterflies do. And then many of them, I should say most of them are day flyers. So that sort of allows you sort of a, a daytime uh, uh, hobby should you want to get in the butterflies. Uh, they're all uh, in the suborder Detricia, that is the ones we have, um, and two large groups of butterflies in the Northeast, and that's the Papillionoidea, that's uh, these larger ones like the Viceroy and Monarchs and those types, and they're fairly big, they're slow in, and erratic in their flight for the most part, some are fairly quick, but relatively speaking, slow enough that you can use a net and, and you know, swipe them out of the air if you're, if you're handy enough with a net. Uh, their antennae are simple and their bodies are fairly thin and long. And that's to contrast with the other large group of butterflies, the Hesperoidea or skippers, which you see depicted here in the lower picture. And these guys are smaller. They're often dark colored, have black uh, edges or black wings. Sometimes they're highlighted with orange. They have a very rapid flight uh, and that sort of skips, hence the name. And if you'll note on their antennae, they have slight hooks on the tips. And that's a good key feature when you're trying to discern whether you've got a, a skipper, one of the skippers, or uh, one of the larger uh, papillionids. And they're also shorter and have sort of a, what looks like a muscular body. And then it actually does have more muscle mass than the typical large uh, butterfly. The shapes of butterflies, of course, come in many different sizes and shapes. Um, their wingspans can exceed six inches across in some of our larger ones, uh, but many, like the skippers, are no more than about three quarters of an inch or an inch long. But look at all the variation of types. And the one thing to notice on this silhouette, uh, which came from uh, Jeffrey Glassberg's uh, Butterflies Through Binoculars book, is the fact that some uh, butterflies roost with their wings closed and some roost with their wings open, hence these different silhouettes. And it helps to recognize which ones have their wings closed at rest versus open to help you identify the different groups. Um, and often, of course, these are highly patterned uh, insects and those patterns are gonna be diagnostic. Um, most of the butterflies that we see have, uh, are monomorphic in the sense that males and females look similar to one another, uh, but we do have some dimorphism in certain groups of butterflies. Uh, dimorphism among the sexes is much more pronounced in moths though uh, than in butterflies. But look at some of the colors and the patterns of these things. Um, pretty, pretty remarkable um, uh, shapes, patterns, and of course, uh, many of these, as you see, are feeding on uh, nectar, uh, and that's a good place to, to take photographs. Um, you know, you don't really have to, to capture many, many of them. In fact, most of them to identify them. A good photograph will be able to help you out in using your field guides. We've got about 750 species in North America. That number is sort of fluctuates up and down a little bit uh, as we get more into the genetic basis of the species. Um, some, and then it becomes kind of critical actually because some of our um, uh, species groups are very, very close. And in fact, we have one that I'll show a picture of in a minute that's called an azure. And the spring and summer azures have sort of 
have thought to be uh, separate species by virtue of their colors, but genetically they're so similar that they're really a species complex and uh, most lepidopterists don't recognize a segregation there on the basis of genetics. So it's kind of useful to have that as a background. In New Hampshire, we have about 83 of the larger species, these papillionoids, and we have about 38 species of the skippers. Uh, of those, you'll see that there are 21 rare species, and that's not all of them are listed by the State Heritage Program, but, but these are considered rare by virtue of their either declining numbers or edge of range uh, or, or lack of good records. Uh, and then of the skippers, about 12 of them are recognized as being pretty rare. Um, as caterpillars, as I mentioned, they um, mostly eat the leafy parts of higher plants. Um, there are some fern leaf consumers, but those mostly are moths, not caterpillars as of, of um, butterflies. And they, uh, of course, eat a whole host of different uh, leafy greens, including some garden vegetables. Uh, much to many people's chagrin, and uh, shoots of tree seedlings and so forth. As adults, they're nectar feeders primarily, but keep in mind that uh, there are also some uh, uh, butterflies that are attracted to uh, sap, particularly in early spring. It's a source of food for things like morning cloak butterflies that are uh, flying uh, on warm days as early as late March. Uh, and as the spring comes along, um, many of the butterflies, particularly in uh, the brushfoots and the, and the uh, swallowtails, will be drawn to mud and or animal droppings for a variety of minerals that they need. So the life cycle, as you, many of you know, it starts out as an egg, which hatches and uh, develops in, in a couple of different stages or instars into different types of larvae. Uh, and then ultimately, um, there's a chemical reaction after a certain period of time uh, that develops uh, that larva into a, a, a pupa. And very often, not always, but very often, that pupa is encased in a cocoon that was uh, drawn out by the larvae itself. Uh, and from that, of course, um, we have uh, adults emerge uh, sometimes in the same year, uh, uh, but sometimes uh, also in the uh, uh, over winter. You can have these, it's more common for the, the later season brushfoots to uh, overwinter as pupae and then emerge in the spring as adults. Uh, they do go through a complete metamorphosis um, with several molts, although most of the adult papillionoids have two, two uh, significant molts in their uh, their outer layer, the corpora alata, uh, then uh, triggers a change uh, hormonally that uh, changes that uh, caterpillar into a, a pupal state. And that, again, is usually done in, in some type of cocoon. Uh, among the seasons, you can see different types of butterflies and different types of um, uh, sort of stages of, of life. As I said, in the wintertime, it's most common to see eggs or pupae, but occasionally you have larvae overwintering. Um, certainly that, that is the case with uh, some of our, our larger and more stout uh, brushfoot butterflies. And occasionally you have adults that will uh, tuck into bark, cracks, and uh, again, brushfoots are common. The morning cloaks are examples. Eastern commas, uh, harvesters, there's a couple of others that will overwinter as adults. Um, these guys emerge in spring and they're immediately after some type of uh, sugar source. And, um, and that's why early, early flowers and the ephemeral flowers of spring become very important. Um, once the uh, uh, adults have successfully uh, sort of mated with their uh, their spouse, as it were. Uh, the eggs are laid fairly shortly thereafter, and these eggs uh, will remain in whatever, wherever they deposit them on the stems of, of plants, sometimes uh, under the leaf litter uh, for a while before emerging as adults and, of course, hatching out and starting to feed. Uh, so you see all, all of the different uh, 
so stages of life in the springtime. Summer, for the most part, you're seeing adults that are flying. And these flights, um, we were talking about this the other day, that uh, the timing of flights is pretty critical if you want to capture or identify certain species. For example, if you're looking at certain types of uh, uh, blue butterflies, and we'll, we'll see some pictures in a minute of that, um, very often uh, you'll have just a winter, one or two week window in the springtime uh, in order to capture them or to uh, see them on flowers feeding. Uh, three to four weeks is a pretty long life for a, a butterfly and of course uh, the, well the most well-known long-lived butterfly are the monarchs, uh, uh, which can, of course, um, live for a couple of months as they migrate uh, either north or south. Uh, one to three broods per year is the uh, most typical case for a lot of our butterflies, um, but uh, uh, some, like monarchs, will only have a single brood. All right, uh, let's see, we've got uh, now just a review of some of the major families uh, of butterflies. They're, they're primarily uh, six, um, five of which fall into that papillionoid uh, uh, subwater, and then uh, the Hesperids or the skippers in the other subwater, Hesperoidea. Um, and we'll go through each one sort of in order. Um, Little tiny, fast blue ones that you see skipping along the ground, sometimes landing right on the ground in the springtime, uh, like this, these pine elfins, and feeding on, on soil or mud. Um, you're into the lacinids, the blues, coppers, elfins. There's one harvester here that's on alder, and then there's several hair streak butterflies, like this Acadian hair streak and this banded hair streak. And these guys are pretty quick. They're, they're kind of tough to, to net, but they, uh, they're they also in the first thing in the morning before they've really warmed up, uh, you can capture them, or I should say photograph them roosting uh, near their nectary sources before they get going in the morning. Uh, we had uh, a couple of weeks ago our North American butterfly count and uh, and recorded about six of these guys in this group, Lacinid, Lacinidae, the blues, uh, silvery blue as well. This year has been a big year for this guy, um, really brightly colored, but no more than about uh, five eighths of an inch long. So pretty tiny and pretty fast. Most people know the swallowtails. And what's interesting is that uh, for a long time, we thought the Eastern swallowtail and the Canadian swallowtail were uh, the same species. Uh, they've been since split apart, and really the best sort of uh, morphological difference between them, aside from their size, which if you don't have them side by side, it's hard to tell, relatively speaking, how big they are, is the fact that the eastern has these spots on the underside of the, uh, the submarginal band being discrete, whereas in the Canadian, you have more or less a continuous band in that submarginal area. Uh, that sort of separates and they're both fairly common. Uh, Canadians right on up to the Alpine zone and certainly throughout a lot of the lowlands of the North Country and the Lakes region. Um, further south in southern New Hampshire we get the spice bush swallowtail and they're very uh, easy to attract to butterfly bushes butter and uh, mil butterfly milkweed and a bunch of good uh, nectary sources but they're not very common up up this far. They're really a southern species. And then you get this odd duck, the, the giant swallowtail. And I say odd because it's it really doesn't typically breed north of Connecticut. Uh, in fact, that's even pretty far north for it. But post-breeding, these guys wander all the way up to Canada. And we had about, I think it was about four years ago, we had a fairly good size of what they call eruption of, of giant swallowtails moving up the coast and moving up the St. Lawrence and the Connecticut rivers. And, and um, there were a lot of places in, in Northern New England that had never seen them before and they were there in pretty good numbers. So some interesting things about the swallowtails. Uh, the Pierids are super fast. Good luck with a net on these guys. <laughs> you know, they'll just fly right by your face and, and zigzag so quickly you you'll just there's no way you can capture them and and yet they're 
they're brightly colored. You can't miss them. About two inches long or so, two and a half inches on a single wing edge. And uh, they come in these mostly yellow colors, but we do have a cabbage white that's uh, a white, uh, largely white butterfly with black spots. And, um, and these guys are, are also pretty fast. Sometimes you can get lucky. And if you've got toothwort, which is a species of plant that comes up early in the spring, you can get um, some of our um, cabbage whites that are in a, a different form uh, that have a netted underwing coming up and feeding on toothwort in, in early as April. But for the most part, these are summer flyers and they will have a, long, a double brood. So you'll see them all the way into September. Uh, they do have some different shapes and sizes uh, to help you identify them. Although look at this orange sulfur is, can have these pale forms and darker forms, almost an orange wing. Um, and it can even be oranger than that. So uh, keep in mind that you can't call them all, you know, clouded sulfur, which is the most common one we've got. Sometimes you get to look closely to see if it's one of the other two species we've got. Uh, when we get into the brushfoots, we get into one of our largest groups of large butterflies. And uh, were this to be sort of a, a group, I'd ask to tell me the difference between these two, which one's the monarch, right? And I know, Dave, you've pointed out this one. I can hear you in the background. <laughs> This is the monarch. You've got a couple extra dots here. Uh, you don't have a, a cross line as you have here uh, in the hind wing of the viceroy. And as many of you know, the viceroy, uh, they theorize is taking after the monarch in its coloration and patterning um, as a sort of predator avoidance strategy, knowing that monarchs are, are toxic to predators, to birds and whatnot. And and, and viceroys have, even though they're not toxic, have followed suit in order to sort of, you know, falsely advertise their deterrence. Uh, monarchs used to be in their own family and group. They've been lumped with the brush fruits, again, genetically. Uh, this is their, of course, their larva feeding on milkweed. Uh, and here's their chrysalis, the pupa that they set, uh, typically on milkweed, sometimes on other, uh, other plant materials. Um, and these guys are just remarkable. We could do a whole program on monarchs. And I believe um, UNH Cooperative Extension has, there's a program that's coming up that I'm um, pretty sure Haley Andriazzi is, is doing for UNH. Um, and you can sort of Google that online. She does a great job talking about monarchs because it's, it's now a listed, federally listed species. So a lot of us are, are partaking in the uh, sort of observation of monarch. In fact, next week, starting J uh, July 27th, is a sort of national count, international count week for the monarchs. And you can get online and, and volunteer to count uh, monarch larvae uh, in your backyard and contribute that as a citizen science project uh, for the international count that takes place all week starting on Monday. So we've got a lot of different brushfoots. This Pearl Crescent, that's the upside, and here's the downside. And in some of these guys, like the crescents, it's really important to take a look at the undersides. Uh, those undersides are often more diagnostic to species than the upper side. When I first saw this one, I thought it was a tawny crescent, which is supposed to be extirpated from New Hampshire, but uh, looking underneath, it was clearly a, a pearl crescent, which is a very pretty common bug. Um, in the brushfoot group, we have the largest, brightest orange, <laughs> oranges butterflies, the fritillaries, um, and there are several of them. Um, there are four of them represented here. This is the uh, great fritillary, great spangled fritillary. This is the underside of that. And again, undersides are pretty important when it comes time to separating some of our fritillaries apart. The silver border is our smallest one. It's also the most northern occurring fritillary, and you'll see that slight whitish silvery edge to the hind and fore wings uh, to help you identify. But it's pretty small and pretty fast. Uh, we've got uh, Atlantis fritillaries, uh, which are also a fairly common medium-sized fritillary, uh, and then Aphrodite fritillaries, which are also uh, not quite as common as the Atlantis, but they're still present and, and accountable in New Hampshire. Um, then we get into some of these 
the the admirals and there's some some terrific species in the admiral group this of course is the white admiral in a sort of mudding pattern and showing both the white striped form and the purple spotted form which is also represented here and this happens to be the same species they're just different color morphs of the same one but it's not a sexual difference at all they're all it's both male and female will do that um, we got uh, American ladies, which are another long distance migrant in the uh, brushfoot group, uh, not quite as long as, as monarchs, but um, these guys will travel well over a thousand miles uh, from wintering grounds to the, to the feeding summering, summer grounds in a similar fashion in, the, in, the, in successive generations. Um, with northern pearly eyes, if you're near a forested swamp or open wetland with alders, you're likely to see this guy. Uh, the eastern commas are an early flyer, um, and they've got these nice scalloped wings to them, very sharp points, and so some people call this subgroup the scallop wings, and there are about five species in that, in that group. And then uh, 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 this other brush foot, which is uh, the eyed brown, and uh, there's a couple of species here in that group that's generally a, a dark brown color. And these guys are flying this week. I have saw quite a few of my, around my house today. So, um, so you can probably still catch some white admiral, so it's getting a little late. It's a little late for the, the commas. Uh, Northern pearly eyes are still flying, uh, and the American ladies are actually not quite... Uh, you know, at their peak yet, and eye browns are moving right now. Um, the spread wing skippers are a little larger than the grass skippers, uh, but notice they, they all have these hooked, clubbed uh, antennae, uh, very visible in this wild indigo uh, dusky wing. And these guys are, are tremendous. There's some, some really good, um, uh, you know, flights of them. They're very localized in certain species. There are several rare species of spread wings. And um, uh, I used to think, for example, the juveniles, dusky wing was a common thing, but it's really not as you get farther north. Uh, of course, I was learning these when I was down in the Keene area. And I call them little big heads <laughs> as a, on account of the shape of the larvae. Uh, that's pretty typical for a, a spread wing skipper caterpillar. Common sooty wings, beautiful thing with some white spots on a charcoal blackish uh, wing pattern. They're unmistakable. Um, that's another, another member of that group. And then last but not least are the grass wing skippers, which uh, as I said, these guys are fast and they are small and they are tough to identify. Uh, actually, when I pulled this slide up from a show I gave last year, I had to look these guys out, a couple of them up again, just because I couldn't remember. They're so close together. Um, and I, I could give you the names, but maybe you won't remember. The only one I might suggest you remember is the Arctic. It's the only spotted, dark, orange spotted skipper that you cannot mistake, mistaken. And maybe the European as well. Um, that that is one of our introduced skippers and it's perhaps the most common skipper you'll see in terms of being mostly all orange but other than that uh, they integrate they've got pretty good sexual dimorphism and and so it's a little little tough to identify these guys all right i'd take a break if i was in person but we're going to jump right in there i've i spent a fair amount of time on butterflies and uh, again, with uh, about, well, 12 to 15 times as many moths, I could spend a lot more time on, on moths. Also order Lepidoptera. But notice how many of them have pectinate or combed uh, antennae. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. But they are not clubbed. And you can see the fact that in this particular moth, they don't have clubs on the tips of their antennae. They are largely nectar feeders, but they also uh, eat on a, uh, feed on a lot of different food sources, vegetative food sources as well. The larvae are leaf chewers, not unlike butterflies, but these guys mostly fly at night, as most of you know. Uh, about nine tenths, 90 percent or so are, are exclusively night flying. We have uh, another five or so percent that are twilight flying only. 
and then about 5% that are uh, day flyers, and that includes a lot of our, our little guys. Moths, not unlike butterflies, have a variety of shapes. Uh, we have some big ones, the silk moths, um, upwards of six inches a, a, across and six inches long. And the lunar moth, our largest moth, in terms of you know length and wingspan. Uh, but we've got a whole lot of little guys too. And I mean thousands of them. So uh, it's always important to kind of pay attention to the general shape of the moths before you try and attempt to identify them. Um, and we'll go through most of these groups, I have a, a photographic uh, sample of all these groups actually, as we go through. Um, for the most part, moths are, you know, kind of drab color. They're not like butterflies. Uh, we have some exceptions, certainly in the silk moth group, but a lot of them are brown or gray. But then you get into the patterns, and those patterns are pretty remarkable. And I've more than a few times I've had people say, "Wow, look at those moths! They are so distinctive." Um, you know, maybe I should pay a little closer attention to them. And of course, if you uh, you know, if you have trouble sleeping at night or you uh, like to go out and join the mosquito crowd in the evening of some summer night, um, yeah, there'll be uh, lots of moths to attend to uh, right out your porch light window, as it were. Uh, about 11,000 species in North America, and that's probably conservative at this point. Um, 4,000 species estimated in the Northeast, and we're probably over 2,000 species in New Hampshire. Um, the closest count we have is a pretty thorough survey of moths in Massachusetts where they've recorded 2,800 species. Uh, they have a few habitats we don't, um, just like we have a few more alpine things they don't. But uh, nonetheless, we're estimating about 2,000. Um, caterpillars, not unlike butterflies, chew the leafy parts of uh, higher plants and also garden vegetables, particularly if you're dealing with hornworms. Yeah, that's a moth. Many of you already know this. These are uh, our sphinx moths. You know, all these hornworms that love tomatoes and cucurbits and so forth. Uh, but some moth caterpillars uh, exclusively le eat leaf litter. There's one group um, I have a picture of, and all these guys can be found if you just rake apart the leaves and you see these little you know, brownish gray, sometimes reddish gray caterpillars underneath the leaves. Those are uh, in this one group of, of noctuid moths. Uh, and then some are lichen feeders, the lichen moth, that's its primary food source. Um, as adults, of course, the nectar feeders, uh, again, not unlike butterflies, but they do also get into sap and mud and animal droppings, just like butterflies, very, very similar in that way as adults. Also similar is their four-part life cycle from egg larva, pupa, to adult. Um, I brought this guy inside. It was uh, just as an ex ex sort of a test and I, she laid eggs uh, and all over the, <laughs> the, the, the bedding of the, of the aquarium and, or a terrarium and, and those eggs hatched and these little tiny larvae started crawling around and you know, I, I set them free. They were ready to go and of course, after a time, just like butterflies, they develop into a, a pupil, pupil case. Um, most of the moth pupae are, are naked. That is to say, they're not enclosed in a cocoon. Uh, we do have some exceptions to that, uh, like gypsy moth, which will lay its uh, uh, caterpillars, will, will sort of enclose themselves in silk, a little bit of silk on the tree bark before they uh, transform into the pupa. Um, and not unlike uh, caterpillars of butterflies, they have you know uh, anal pro legs uh, and spiracle, spiracles across the side of the body, abdominal segments, and a, a enlarged thoracic section that uh, can aid in the identification of the of the moth. Like this guy here, which is a polyphemus uh, silk moth caterpillar. They fly. Uh, Pretty much most months of the year, you'll see Lynn Scott, who is an avid moth person in Ontario. She's got a, a sort of a system for keeping track and only January and February are excluded from her calendar. And in this one example, what she has done, of course, is recorded the dates 
of flight in May and June for this particular species, the white pine cone borer. Um, so it's, and there are some, you'll see that's, you know, it's almost a month long in terms of the average flight of this, of this uh, moth adult, but uh, some of them are like butterflies only a, a week or two long and some are go as much as six or seven weeks uh, before they expire. Um, spring is great for emergence and hatching and initial larval feeding and summer and fall is when the most, most of the flights take place. Um, you'll see certain groups attached to certain times. The cuculeans, or, or these are uh, uh, one of the type of owlet moths. Um, these are the sap eaters and come out as soon as you get a, a night over 40 degrees in the springtime. And I call them the sap moths because more often than not, they're in your buckets. And it's a sort of a sign that, yeah, and the sugar season's about over once you start seeing a lot of sap moths in your buckets. Uh, then soon thereafter in April and May, we start seeing the looper moths, that's the geometers, uh, emerge as adults. And uh, they're just, you know, again, hundreds of species of loopers. Many of them are specific to feeding on as caterpillars on certain species of plants. Um, and some can be obviously pests and uh, sort of considered as pathogens in that regard relative to forest trees. Uh, we have different ones coming out uh, as we go through the summer uh, and as we hit sort of the warmest part of the year we get these smaller guys. Sonia's Eclaris, Pseudoxenteras, these are the micro moths um, that uh, we have thousands of and they're really mostly uh, summer occurring. That's also when we see our giant silk moths, our tomato hornworm and hornworm sphinx moths uh, emerging as, as adults, and many of our, our very showy tiger moths as adults are flying in the midsummer. And then we're back to owlets in the fall for the most part. I mean, there'll be some other, other groups flying, but the owlets really take over in the fall period. This is our largest, the Luna moth. Um, it's one of the silk moths, and uh, they're just, just remarkable. They have about a two-week flight period. Uh, it's already gone by. Some of you probably have seen them. Uh, it's usually the first and second week of June when you see peak uh, occurrence of these guys. Um, but in general, we have um, five suborders, 23 subfamilies, about 65 families. There's, there's quite, a, quite a taxonomic diversity of this group. And there's, there's your sort of classic example of a micro versus a macro. Um, the micros are millimeters long, three, four, five, six at most. Uh, and it's really a arbitrary distinction, uh, but among lepidopterists, it's a significant one. I, I know a lot of people who are into moths and they, we, I say the word micro and they just shake their head and turn away. It's like, yeah, no. I'm not into micro moths. I mean, it, you know, you mostly have to use a microscope to identify them. Um, and there are thousands of them and they're, they can be very difficult, but they're very important. And you know, they have a tremendous role uh, to play in nature, not only uh, um, as food for birds, which is, a, you know, these, all of our gleaning birds are picking off the larvae of these guys, but they're also uh, bat food and bird food in, in flight. Uh, all right. So some of the common families, um, we've got uh, in the micro group, the leaf rollers. And you may have seen these where you've got the larvae will actually roll a leaf around itself as it pupates. Uh, and that uh, tends to be in this group, the Ecophoridae. Um, you've got leaf miners that as larvae, they create all those netted patterns on the surface of the leaf, leaving the veins intact as the Galakeids. Um, we also have a bunch of the leaf uh, um, eating tortricids, and that's this group down here. And many of these are day flyers, like you see this guy here on ferns and uh, feeding on the fern. And so that's uh, uh, as larvae they feed in the fern, uh, one of the many of the micro moth group. Uh, some of you may have seen the funeral, funeral moth, so-called, uh, Desmia funeralis, as these blackish 
uh, wings with white spots. These are day flyers, and they're very common in dense uh, fern, fern areas, um, wet, moist forests, and so forth. Uh, if you're walking through a field, you're more, more than likely to scare up a few hundred of these guys, the crambids, so-called, the crambidae, uh, or what they call grass veneer moths. And yeah, they looks like, you know, they, they land on grass, they feed on grass, and it looks like a bump on, a gra on the grass, except they're brown or white. So, but that's uh, where these guys hang out. You've got a, a genus of, of, uh, of aquatic moths that actually have larvae that live in water um, and feed on the above uh, water or s water surface parts of the plants um, during the summer and these are the pair points group. So there's all of these different uh, pyrrolids have uh, sometimes very specialized habits of occurrence. You get into the plume moths and this is one of the ones I like to show people because they say, really? That's a moth? Come on. <laughs> and it's incredibly intricate. Um, and Habersini scripta, you can imagine why they call it scripta, it's just got to be one of the most beautiful pattern moths out there. And these guys will come to your porch lights. Uh, these, they fly in uh, early summer. Uh, they've gone by by now, but uh, they're just incredible. You can't mistake them for anything else. And in the day, you will see these tiny, thin-winged, narrow-bodied plume moths with excessively long legs, which help them land on grasses and other very light vegetation. Um, and that's another fascinating group of moths. Um, I can't show pictures of all the groups, but we have ones that are, uh, look like miniature hummingbirds, the hummingbird moth, you may have seen those. We've got uh, a whole group, uh, the Cesseids, that are uh, look like um, yellow jackets. We call them the yellow jacket moths. So there are a lot of different forms of moths that would normally look like other types of insects. Uh, pretty small family, the Japanids. We have three members, but this guy's pretty rare. I've only had one at my porch light in 15 years. And they're, they're a little bit more of a southern species. They do tend to be in drier forests like pine barrens. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, you know, in, sort of nice to see the diversity in the hook tip moth group, at least this one's showing up. And then of course the loopers. I mean, there are more loopers than, like I said, you can shake a stick at. There are a lot, hundreds. And uh, trying to identify some of these apart uh, is, is challenging. I've given you some good imagery here, some good, you know, fairly robust, early, early emergent adults, but after a week or two, a lot of these colors fade, the scales fall off, and just like you know, everybody else, we get old and we don't look the same as we did when we were kids. So uh, everything gets old and, and looks kind of weathered after a while. Um, a typical looper caterpillar, uh, inchworm, right? That's what these loopers are. Uh, and they have that pattern of, of reduced prolegs uh, in one, one end of the body that f allows them to then loop up as they move across the surface of, of vegetation. And some, like this electrosis, is, you know, you can barely see this thing as it lands on bark. Uh, it's pretty amazing um, to, to try and, you know, pick this out, it blends right in. And this group is of course a tropical group uh, where there are several members that are even more camouflaged than this one, but good luck finding it. Um, more looper moths, just to show some of the diversity. This one's about four inches across, pretty good size one. This one has some bright purplish colors. They're just some really incredibly patterned uh, looper moths out there. Couldn't not mention the forest tent caterpillar moth as we've begun to see the tents developing. The caterpillars yesterday were about a half inch long and they were just starting to really swell the tips of, of various hardwoods, at least where I was. And um, here's our two, the eastern and the forest tent uh, caterpillars. Those are the two members of that group. And they both have similar types of um, uh, uh, sort of foliage defoliating uh, caterpillar with caterpillars with uh, with hairs in the silk moss the large ones that we saw the luna this is um, um, one of the other large 
uh, silk moths we have, um, uh, Polyphemus, and then the Proth Prometheus moth, these two. Uh, very uh, common, uh, I should say, uh, very obvious, but maybe not as common as they used to be. Um, we've had a slight decline in the population of our large Saturnins, with the exception of, of course, our rosy maple moth. And the rosy maple moth, oh my God, that thing is just, I've counted upwards of 300 individuals <laughs> around my porch light. So these guys can be pretty uh, prolific and as a consequence can be somewhat considered as a pest relative to their caterpillars that uh, hit the hardwoods. Just got a couple left. The sphinx moths, there's uh, one of our more common uh, horn worms, as it were, as an adult. This is the wave sphinx with all these uh, wave marks on the on the body and then the walnut sphinx, which is a, these represent the two different subfamilies of the sphingidae or sphinx family. Um, they're both about equally as common and, and about 15 or 16 members each. Uh, and you'll see various types of, uh, of these sphinxes coming to porch lights, coming to various lights. You know, when you're filling up at the gas station, you can see these flying, <laughs> flying above you at night. Prominence are coming in a variety of different forms. And these guys, Saddleback Prominent, you may have heard, is uh, sometimes considered a pest. Um, they have episodic population outbreaks uh, that can defoliate hardwoods. Um, <clears throat> and there are a lot, of, a lot of different kinds. Not as big a group as uh, the geometers, but certainly a fairly good size group. Um, and then the tiger moss, which uh, come in a variety of different bright colors, sometimes pure white, and many of these, like this Virginia tenucha, uh, are day flyers. Uh, we saw a lot of these on the butterfly count a couple weeks ago, and they're pretty darn common. Uh, if you have, uh, uh, this is dog mane flowers, but if you have any sort of large uh, flower cluster right now, I, I saw Joe Pieweed in bloom, and they love Joe Pieweed. Uh, they love milkweed. Uh, these guys are pretty darn common, Virginia uh, tiger moths or Virginia tenuchas. Um, yeah. And then the owlets. Last but not least, we have a number of different owlet groups. Uh, those leaf, dead leaf eaters are these four right, well, actually these three right here in the uh, Herminiani. That's a subfamily of the Noctowids. And these guys uh, overwinter as pupa under the leaf, the leaf litter and as larvae um, uh, eat nothing but leaves, dead leaves, which is kind of a good thing. Um, helps feed a bunch of ground organisms in that sense, you know, mice and voles and so forth are big consumers of these guys uh, when they're in the larval state. Uh, this one, the parallelia, which I always remember, it's got parallel lines on it, a really nice uh, noctuid moth, and that one is uh, uh, flying right now. It's got a very long flight period, uh, about four weeks. As an owlet goes, that's a pretty darn long period of time. But there are a whole host of other ones. And some of these, like the Zales, uh, would have been in Jeff's talk on pine barrens because we have a couple of state endangered Zale species. And in fact, the owlets, they're more rare owlets than there are in any other group of moths. More diversity, just to, just waiting for it. I love the the uh, what they call the yellow horned moth. These antennae are not only pectinate combed, but they're bright, uh, sort of golden when they're fresh. Uh, it's an unmistakable species. So there's some neat features of some of these guys. Um, the sword moths look like they have little swords drawn on them. Uh, the acronictus and um, <clears throat> another great group of. Uh, summer flying moths. Uh, <clears throat> here's the, more of the owlets with the, uh, the, sat, the sat moth group represented by this one, Eupsilia uh, tristigmata, and that's, that's sap that's actually rolling off the back of this thing. So uh, I'll give you an example of some of the noctowids that are uh, overwinter as adults and then fly early in the spring to try and find uh, early nectar and sap. So Coming to a close here. Um, it's easy to set up 
a light trap in your backyard. You don't have to be real fancy about it. This is the trap that I typically use, but it's a black light. And the black light is a great tool for attracting night flying insects, uh, mostly moths, but you'll also get other things <laughs> at your black light. Um, with a 12 volt battery, uh, these things will go all night and, and you can end up with some pretty, pretty remarkable bucks. So that is uh, more or less the, the end of that. I'm going to bring it back into gallery view, stop the share, and see if we have some chat questions. Uh, there was one chat question. Let me pull it up. And it was, what are ah. the effects of climate change on New Hampshire's population of Carner Blues? Okay. Well, that's a really, it's a good question. Um, can't give you the exact answer. Um, the biggest concern that I have observed, and I'm sure there's a lot of other folks who have sort of you know, can give you different answers, is the episodic droughts, right? We had two months of drought, and it happened to be when the lupin, which is the obligate plant species that carnivore blues live on, were supposed to be coming into flower and, and producing nectar. And I watched a lot of different insects on various flowers not getting nectar because of that drought. So that would be one huge concern. No nectar, no adult survival, fewer eggs, less progeny. That would probably be the first. And the other thing about drought, however, possibly a silver lining, but usually not the case, certainly not in the conquered pine barrens, is the fact that it will yield itself to more frequent wildfires which in the pine barrens is a good thing. Because more wildfire produces more lupin, more lupin, more carner blues. But as you all know, um, wildfires are typically put out as soon as they're, they're found and discovered. And unless you're Jeff Lugie with the, as the burn boss on a fire crew out in Ospie pine barrens, um, you're probably not gonna get a lot of cooperation in terms of, um, oh, let it burn, please. We want to save a butterfly. Yeah, no. Not if it's bearing down on one of the state buildings in the Concord Pine Barrens. So anyway, great question. If anyone Other else has a question they, they would just like to ask, you can unmute yourself and, yeah. and feel free to ask the question. I, mine's more of a general observation, Rick. And I just thought it was kind of interesting that there are so many different ways that butterflies and moths overwinter. So, yes. I mean, you can overwinter as an adult, as a pupa, as eggs. So would you say is one better than another? They're just all different. It's, you know, it's, I say the same thing with mushrooms. You know, you got mushrooms occurring in every single possible niche you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and they've only done so to survive by specializing yeah. and avoiding the competition. Yeah. So, you know, I'd say the, the least common thing in the moth group is larvae overwintering. That's oh, really? not as common. Yeah. Beetles, yeah. another story, right? Japanese beetles dig down, they burrow down, and they're out of the frost zone or at least not getting hit so hard. But that's not something that larvae can easily do in the moth world. So that'd be the least common life form overwintering. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I had no idea. And yet there's a formula. Anybody can do this. You know, we're going to hit another winter as far as I can tell. And it's going to get cold. And in March, you're going to say, dang, you know, it's still winter. And where are the critters? And you can go out there take some stale beer, like one, one banana that's rotten, one glass of stale beer, and a tablespoon of molasses. Mix it up, paint a tree outside your house where you can easily get to it. That's the secret. And come back in the twilight and see the moths that are emerging 
from their bark crevices looking for yeah. sugar. And believe me, they can smell sugar from hundreds of feet, if not yards away. And you'll see all these moths starting to feed on this mash that you've painted on the tree bark. Amazing to see that. And it's encouraging because there's life out there yet <laughs> in March. <laughs> I've had them in February too, so. Wow. Anyway. Rick, Charlie, I'm a rank amateur, but uh, some interest now in butterflies in particular. But so two yeah. questions, one maybe a moth question. I took a photo of a cranberry clear wing, which it's a moth, is it, versus a butterfly? Yeah, it's a moth. Yeah, okay. but... And second, um, the, sw the, the uh, tiger, the swallowtails, the tiger swallowtails. Is it only the Canadian that are here in the valley or is there an overlap with the... Uh, you got an overlap. Yeah, you'll have both of them. Um, I tend to notice that the Easterns emerge a little earlier than the Canadians and that your first flights, you know, the first ones you see on the lilacs and so forth are Easterns. Uh, but pretty soon thereafter, you'll see Canadians. And my observation around here in the Lakes region has been that the Canadians uh, are a little more common, a little more abundant in the Lakes region. And I would suspect so in the same, the same case in, in, um, in, the, in the valley. And, uh, and as, of course, as you go farther north, the Canadians become the more dominant of the two swallowtails. There's no so, clear line of delineation. No, they're, not that I know of. They, they really do overlap. We got both species on the NAB account on July 13th. So, yeah. Thank you. When, uh, when the uh, caterpillars are shedding their skins, they're in stars, do they ever eat it? That's a good question. I, I don't know that they do. I don't know that they do. Uh, I can't answer that. It's a great question. I've got to go figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> do you have reason to believe they do, Lucy? Well, yeah. I, I, um, well, I watched one today shedding, and uh, it didn't. But the other day, there was another one that looked like it was huh. eating it. Huh. I'll be darned. I am sure that, you know, the protein that's content in that shed somebody's eating it. It may not yeah. be the caterpillar, but it could very well be a mite, you know, uh, could be a thrip, could be larvae of a beetle, you know, nothing usually goes to waste. <laughs> yeah. And, um, the, um, you know, watching moths at night with a black light is super good for us because we learn a lot right but how what's the what's the impact for the moths well that, that's a really good question um one of the things that i've learned uh, because of course the traditional lepidopterist um you know spike their black lights with some type of killing reagent usually uh, ethyl acetate and i tend to not favor that unless I really have to get a voucher specimen down to the zoological museum. So the trick with the black light is that you need to monitor it on a, on a regular basis, right? You need to check it. Some people say, oh, just stick the black light out there and in the morning come and check to see what you got in the bucket. No, no, but by then you will have had, you know, four Japanese you know, beetles or five water bugs and some big heavy things hit the light and crush virtually all of the moths that are at the bottom. So that's, and of course, the other thing you can do is you don't have to have a trap. You just stick up a black light, right, and sheet it. A lot of people just do sheeting and they'll fly up to the sheet, hang out there close enough. You can take a picture with your cell phone and away you go. You can identify it from there. That's the easiest way. We did that yeah. last year. Jeff Luigi did in the Pine Barrens. We had a, a program. It was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Most of oh, those little brown ones that you were showing. Oh yeah. Yeah. But well. if they, if they, if we weren't having the light on, they would be going about their business, right? And us having the light on makes them distracted from what they're doing. Well, yes, that's true. Um, and of course. There's a lot of lights out there <laughs> in the developed world. So it's, uh, we're definitely having an impact 
on sort of the normal behavior uh, of moths at night uh, because they are drawn to light. Uh, it's like campfires in the summer at night. You know, uh, how many of us jump into the fire willingly? You know, <laughs> and that's an unfortunate incident, but we do have that effect. And we actually talked about that uh, the, the other night where uh, there's a big study going on Northeast for rare moths and how far does a black light, you know, attract moths? And so, which is a good question. You have to know that in order to sample them properly. And, and people were saying upwards of 30 meters, that's about a hundred feet. And I, I would maintain it's even farther than that, especially if it's a moonless night and there's good visibility through the woods. You might even get them as much as 150 feet or 200 feet away. So that, that is somewhat of an impact. Keep in mind though, that we have, you know, literally tens of thousands of moth individuals in our neighborhood. It's like dragonflies. You know, I have dragonflies landing in my house. I don't have a water body, but maybe a half a mile away. And they have emerged from that water body and have flown all the way to my little backyard and roosted. And that tells me that there are enough of them to be able to do that in the neighborhood at that distance from their emergence site. So we do have a lot of them. That's the good news. Uh, but when I see things like that Arita rosia that I've seen only once, I, I do get concerned that, you know, I've artificially brought this <laughs> bug into my neighborhood, into my porch light, uh, you know, so, so called against its will. Uh, Rick, we did have a uh, chat. Um, question. Yeah. I have heard that there are some predatory caterpillars. Do we have any in New Hampshire? Uh, predatory, yes. Um, and that assumes that they're eating animals. I'm okay. That's generally the, and yes, we do. Um, we actually have a couple of different species, and I'm tr trying to think of the most common one that we would recognize. Oh, uh, let's see. And if anybody has one on the tip of their tongue, please mention. But it's a micro moth. And there, are, I believe, if my memory serves, the larvae of this moth will eat fly larvae. Um, the cecids, the clear wings, uh, do that as well. They are predatory. Um, not entirely, but they can be. And I've seen the oak clear wing do that. Uh, let's see. Adults, though? Well, caterpillars you asked about. So uh, that's the, the critical one. Keep in mind, too, that uh, there are some adults that don't eat at all, right? It's not uncommon. It's not, it's, you know, very common in the insect world to have adults not feed uh, and not even have mouth parts that allow them to feed. That also occurs in the caterpillar, caterpillar world, even though, uh, as, as I said, most of them are nectar feeders as adults. Yeah. Here's another very, very specific question. I'm trying to, I'm thinking she meant trap coddling moths oh, in my yeah. ap apple orchard. Can I <laughs> trip, trick them into a black light trap rather than spraying? Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, and that's the truth be told. I, I don't think I've gotten one coddling moth on at my porch light. Uh, I, don't, I don't even remember getting one of my black lights. So there are some moths that just don't fly to light, which is one reason I was saying before about the bait in the springtime. You, can't, you can hang a light in the middle of the woods in March, you won't get those, uh, you know, lithophanies and eucilias flying. You're gonna get them into bait. They don't they're not attracted to, to light. And that's, uh, in a lot of the field guides, like, you know, the Peterson Field Guide to Moss and so forth, I don't know if you can see that, but um, it's a great book, and it does give you some hints as to which ones will be attracted to light. Uh, coddling Moth is not one of those, so I'm, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, though, Eleanor. <laughs> nice try. I know. What makes them attracted to light, though? Like, what's the, is it a hormone? Is it a brain thing? It is both, and and you know the chemistry of it is is um, a little beyond. But 
John Himmelman, in his book, Moths, Discovering Moths, has a little chapter on there, and he ends it by saying that there are different theories, which I think there are, relative to why moths are attracted to light. Um, but that's, uh, and it, it's sort of like when I get the question, you know, why, why do mushrooms have color? You know, there's not one answer. In fact, there may not be a really good answer yet. <laughs> It's a good question, though. It's a great question. I know. I wish well, I could. I really thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. All right. Any other questions for uh, for Rick? I can do uh, one more. Okay. Um. So there's those um those kinds of bugs, true bugs that have the that have the um, piercing. Yes, piercing mouth parts. Okay, and they and they do the caterpillars. <laughs> Yeah. But are, is there, are, have some of those been introduced to deal with caterpillars and taken over, or is that my imagination? No, that's, uh, you're thinking of tachinid flies. So no. there's a group, there's a group of flies that were introduced in the 1920s, actually, to handle some of the caterpillar pests that apparently were hitting crops back in New England at that time. It was, I believe the release site was in Boston. And the tachinids, unfortunately, um, you know, they were trying to go after things like the cherry scallop moth and so forth, but, you know, the flies aren't specific to what they, caterpillars they eat. And so the theory as to why we have so few of our big moths, you know, the, the, the Saturnid moths, is because of the tachinid fly populations, which are still here and are still doing quite well and still eating a lot of caterpillars. And that's one of the theories as to why some of our moth species are now rare, at least in the Saturnid group, but probably some of the other groups as well because of the tachinids. So that's, that's the, the most common sort of, you know, biological control for caterpillars that we've seen. There's, of course, BT has been used extensively when there's a spruce budworm outbreak. They'll actually spray it over the forests of Canada on these regeneration spruce fir plantations to try and reduce. But of course, BT, which is a bacterium, affects all caterpillars, <laughs> you know, all larvae, I should say, not just, you know, lepidops. So. I, Jen Holmboken has them at her house and they get the emerging butterflies. Yeah. 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 yeah so. Yeah, that's a problem. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, that was really great. You guys are awesome. I, you know, I couldn't see you before, so I had no, no, no clue as to whether I was talking to a blank audience who where everybody was muted, but I'm glad that it was able, we were able to get it together, so. Um, you know what, there was one very quick one. I think chipmunks yeah. may be eating my emerging monarchs. Is that possible? I believe chipmunks will eat anything. But. Yeah, pro <laughs> probably, although uh, they're not gonna do it very long. <laughs> You know, one bite is probably enough to kill them. But, you know, if oh, they eat true. the whole caterpillar, they too will not survive. Yeah. <laughs> Those caterpillars yeah, are go. darn toxic. So, yeah. 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 But turkeys, I've seen turkeys eat that chrysalis. Yeah, I, I don't know about turkeys, but I would suspect that birds um, have a little, e larger birds like that would have a little easier time digesting it. Um, and certainly game birds, which have a bigger crop, more digestive capabilities because they're eating, you know, as you know, acorns and so forth. Uh, it's not like, um, you know, like a Phoebe that's, that's eating flying insects that would probably expire after eating a monarch yeah. chrysalis, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rick. All righty. All right. Have a good evening. On to the next. Thank you, Rick. Turn your light on so you can see the, uh, yeah. see the moth. So. Anyway, take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, right, all. Yep. Mom, stay on. <coughs> Oops. Are you there, Mom? Unmute yourself. Oh. You have to unmute yourself. Just hit the little microphone with the line through it. Can you figure out how to do it?
Okay, unmute. Oh, there you go. All right, all right. Well, there's still a bunch of people on now, so hold on. Uh, so did Sherry get you set up? That was good. You surprised yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just had a caller and she was there. Oh, yeah. I had and had uh, I had called her earlier and I just left her a message. And I mean, because they sometimes had joined in uh, joined mm -hmm. in before. Um, so anyway, well, that was good. Do that much about <laughs> about uh, um, moths. Oh, butterflies and moths. Yeah. I'm looking at those pictures of all those moths, and I'm just, yeah. I, they're, yeah, they're crazy. Yeah, well, and then and then when he said that about uh, how tiny they are, and you have to look under a microscope to identify them. Forget it. Forget it. So, uh, anyway. Well, okay. There's still one more person on, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, the... <laughs> Butterflies. Are, you know, I, I guess I didn't realize either that, like, something like a Luna moth, you know, it makes sense. You only see them for a short period of time, but up here in early June, that just seemed really early to me. I mm. kind of just thought they were around all summer, and I mean, really, just two weeks that they're, um, you know what? Uh, that was interesting. He said about the chipmunk that that would, would, eat one and, and and they would die. Oh, because monarch butterflies are poisonous. Huh. Just the caterpillars, that. yes. See, mm. that's the whole thing. So or, you know what a monarch butterfly is? And then there's a butterfly called a viceroy butterfly. And viceroy butterflies, I don't know if you were one at that point, look exa almost exactly like a monarch. It's called mimicry. So oh. that it's a, but they're not poisonous. But they animals learn that they that that coloration means poison so they won't eat them so uh -huh. even though they are poisonous uh -huh. you know? so hmm. that's one of those isn't nature wonderful kind of thing you know right. what I, mean? yeah. I know yeah so uh -huh. anyway um, is Lori is sherry still on no she said she went out to walk uh, Murphy. She said, I had a busy day with work stuff. So Michael was feeling better, but today's been a bit tough again. He's stopping his pain meds, so that's probably got a lot to do with it, I would imagine. So. Oh, well, that's a good sign. She stopped the pain meds. Yeah, you know? no, that is that is good. So, I got a big storm of brewing here. Yeah, we do too. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. yeah, it was coming in while we were having this oh, on. It's like blowing in, but it didn't do anything so far. So this two thing is so weird. I mean, I have been fine. It doesn't hurt not on wood at all. Now I've been taking the pain. I've been taking Advil and Tylenol, but I'm gonna even. I'm doing something every two hours. I don't even need to do that. I'm gonna back off to just every four hours or whatever. But I gotta tell you, I'm just exhausted. And I guess that's just if you're fighting an infection. Yeah. Right? I don't know. I mean, I took a nap this afternoon. I can't I never take naps. I fell asleep yesterday afternoon. But yesterday I could understand because I had just gone through it. It was really gross and blah, 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 you know. But I don't know by the time I came home. But you know what? I was also reading and reading just makes me tired. So maybe it's just a combination. Just, tired. Eyes are tired. Oh, what was that? Yeah. Your yeah. eyes are tired. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm hoping I just feel better tomorrow. Mm. I just don't have any energy, you know. Mm. So, um, well, talking about tea, it, you had one out on one side, didn't yes. you? Yes, yes. And I never had the in, implant put in because it was so expensive. But it's well, annoying. I will it, say it's annoying. Oh. I wish I had a tooth there, and that was half the reason I went and said, "Okay, I have to have at least one side of my mouth." Where I've got fully functioning teeth, you know. But honestly, the teeth, the tooth, as it stands right now, are so short it's not making contact with my back tooth, and it doesn't matter. Hill of beans, I could have easily just pulled that tooth, which may be exactly what still happens. So, who knows? We're waiting to hear from the dentist at this point. 
Well, yeah. I'm trying to decide because I have one tooth here that he thinks I should do something with. And, you know, at my age, I just don't know if I want to bother because it well, I would have I'm telling one. you I'm telling you this right now you do not want to get your tooth pulled that hurts man what was that you, you don't do not want to get your tooth pulled that hurts yeah but so does uh getting yeah. a cap all that stuff too and it hurts in a different way I don't my cap doesn't hurt a root canal yeah it's uncomfortable but no I mean uh, getting your tooth pulled it's like and it could get infected and yeah it just, mm -hmm. I didn't like it I didn't like it but no, no, whatever. Um, so, I mean, if all you need is a cap, is that what you need, a cap? Yeah, he said it would be a, a thousand, thousand and one dollar, one hundred, eleven hundred dollars. I don't know why it's so damn expensive. That's ridiculous. Well, yeah. Um, and I, I told you about my arm. I had not. Yeah, right. But you know, I've been the last few days now, the last two days, I've been putting um, a rice thing on it from the microwave, you know? Mm -hmm. I've been doing that for about three times a day. And I think it's helped a lot. I don't know if oh, I want to. Oh, that's good. Did you ever get um, Arnica oil? Do you know what that is? Did you ever do that? What's it called? Arnica oil. It's an herbal, you know, an herbal thing. Or even Aunt Claudie's stuff. I, I think know. some of her stuff is, has Arnica in it. I was thinking. I know it does. That. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. Excuse me. So. Yeah. So the guy who did this program, he's like the smartest person I know. He knows everything about everything. Like, Butterflies, mushrooms, birds, trees. Huh. None of his work with him. He's great. He's, he's a good teacher. He was a professor at a college oh really anyway yeah well his name below says wendy what is that oh mean? that's his wife oh okay it's a, you know using <laughs> that could be a little confusing yeah oh, that's funny so huh. anyway okay well okay did they the other person hang up yet oh i yes i, I can i uh yes i would not have been talking like this if there was anybody else on um no, I could control it, so I just removed her. I just turned her off. <laughs> oh, okay. I think she just had walked away and forgot she was signed in or whatever. So I tell you, these things are so funny. There was this one, one woman on there, and she just didn't sit still. She's up and down and moving, and her arms up, and it's just like, oh my gosh. So oftentimes, like if I'm doing it, and I, I can get like that too, just to sit and watch something, you know you can blacken yourself out. You know, if I turn, say if I go like that, you can't see me, but you can hear me, right? Yeah. You know, so I would do that because it's distracting if, if, if she's, yeah. You know. so, <laughs> anyway, but that's, and that's what that woman had done. She had black, blackened herself out, but her picture was still there. So I don't even, I don't even know who it was. So <laughs> anyway, it's funny. Okay, well. All right, well, hey, I'm glad you joined. That was nice. So Have I won't call you back now because I saw your call. But uh, Have a good night call. All right. Oh. Love oh. you. Good good night. Bye bye. Bye.